1776 and the 1780s, they, they took several different forms of government and they looked at them all and they studied them and there was a lot of uh, debate. There was a lot of uh, disagreement about, about how this government was going to work and how this idea was going to happen. And eventually, they, after wrangling and debating, and, and, I, I, and when I say debate, it wasn't all good-natured debate. There was some serious, uh, serious debates that took place, and, and uh, feelings were hurt, and, and uh, there was compromise, and, and uh, this whole process turned out to be a miraculous thing, because out of all of it, We've got this amazing country, this amazing idea called America. Amen. And, and of course, here we are in 2021, and, and we know what came out of that. We see what became the greatest nation in the world. But it all started with an idea, and that idea ultimately was God's idea. And... It was predicated on several things, but one of the things that was important that, that made this, this form of government, this idea of America, so much different than all the other governments in the world at that point, was this idea that man could govern himself. You see, all the other governments had this idea that, that, that there needed to be a government or a, a, a small group of people that would determine and would govern how everyone else lived. And the idea of America was that these men set up and, and it was, that was guaranteed to us in our Constitution was that we the people would be the government. We would govern ourselves. The idea of America was always supposed to be that the people would control the government. The people, the government would work for the people. It's the first time it had ever been tried yes. at this level. And it was, a, it was a brand new idea. It was a novel idea. And, and, and like I said, these men, for them, it was almost an experiment because they didn't know, they didn't really know if, if man could govern himself without, without a, 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 a ruling government that would control everything. The idea was, for the people to control the government, not for the government to control the people. Mm -hmm. Now, that idea is in jeopardy today. When I say it's in jeopardy, it is but it isn't. Because the idea was God's idea. It was God's plan. And I don't believe God's idea could be in jeopardy. Amen. But, from a human standpoint, it feels like and it seems like that we are in jeopardy of going back to a system where the government rules the people. And that there's a ruling class, there's a, there's a small group of people that need to sort of be in control because... As human beings, man is not capable of ruling himself. Mm -hmm. And that idea right now is, is being threatened. And we're in danger of losing it forever. Mm -hmm. So I was having a conversation this week with God about this on Monday or Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I was out in the kitchen and I... I asked, I was, I, 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 this thought process, I started thinking about this, and, and I asked God this question. I said, why, God, did you trust your idea with man? Why did you gamble on man? Why did you risk your plan on man? Because I was thinking, I'm looking at what's going on, and I'm thinking how we are trashing God's idea with what's going on in our country right now. 
We're giving up our freedom. We're giving up our ability to govern ourselves. And we are, we are saying, and I don't mean us in this room, I'm talking about collectively as a country, we're in danger of giving up that freedom and saying, no, we need a ruling class. We need somebody that's smarter than the rest of us, that's, that's more capable of telling the rest of us how to live. Mm -hmm. And we want those people to pass laws and tell the rest of us how, what we can do and what we can't do, how we can worship, how we can't worship, because that's, that's what's going on. And I said, God, why did, you, why did you trust this amazing idea with mankind? Because it feels a little bit like we're ruining it. We're, we're destroying it. And then I took that question one step farther. And I said, God, why did you trust your creation? The, the, the man that you created in your own image, why did you trust that with man because that's what God did when he created man with free will to choose whether or not we would serve God or not serve God he gave us the ability and he gave man that choice to choose between serving God and not serving God I said why did you do that why did you why did you it, it, it seemed like a great gamble from my perspective. Why did, why did God take that risk? Why didn't, why didn't God set it up a different way? Why did, why did, he, why did he give man the ability, the, the choice to sin? Because we know how that worked out from Genesis chapter 3. We know that story. We are living that story. All of us have dealt with the repercussions of that in our own lives from that choice. Now, we could blame Adam and Eve. And if you're a man, we would just blame Eve. <laughs> but it, we could blame them. But the truth of the matter is we have to take responsibility for our own sin. And we know, every one of us in this room knows that we're all sinners. That we, come, we came short. We made bad choices. Now it's true, we were born into sin. We were born with a sin nature. But every one of us knows, down inside of us, that we're guilty. And so... I asked God this question. I said, why did you trust your amazing creation? Why did you trust me to not screw this up? Because there's a lot of days when I think I screwed it up. Now, I found something interesting in this conversation. I realized something that I already knew. A lot of times... When I ask God a question, and I think I'm asking God a question, in reality what's going on is that Holy Spirit is asking me a question. So a lot of times, it, a lot of times you'll find this out when you start praying and when you start asking God, especially if you start asking God why He's doing something. If you stop and think about it for a little bit, you'll start to understand and realize that actually what's going on is Holy Spirit is asking you that question. He's asking you to consider this, to think about this, mm -hmm. and to seek God to find out why he did something. Mm -hmm. And so as I was contemplating this and as I was having this conversation with Holy Spirit, I, I, I realized Holy Spirit was asking, actually asking me this question. Why did God risk it? Why did he why did he gamble? Now I knew I knew right away that God doesn't gamble. In fact God can't gamble. Because in order to gamble you have to not you have to not know what's gonna happen. That's the nature of gambling is to is to risk something on on an event that you know people gamble on the Super Bowl. 
There's a million different ways you can gamble. If you go to Las Wages, they, they have, you could gamble on anything out there. I mean, they have a, they have a uh, what do they call it, a line, I think, that they, they have on just about every event that's going on in the world. You can, you can put money on who you think, what you think is going to happen tomorrow. Vegas has slot machines in the airport. Yeah, it's like in the airport. Yeah, so you can you can risk you can risk, but in order to gamble, you have to not know what's going to happen. It's the only way you can gamble. Well, God can't do that because He already knows exactly what's going to happen, so He He can't. So the bottom line was God wasn't taking a risk. Because he knew what was going to happen. So I asked God, I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I didn't even know how to rephrase the question. Because in my own mind, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So it's hard for me to really get my mind around the fact that God does. Yeah. So I didn't even know how to ask the question. But I continued to ask the question, why did you do this? Why did you, why did you put this brilliant idea called America... Why did you put creation in the hands of man? And God answered me out of Isaiah chapter 19. Not a complete answer in the way you might think, but this is... In fact, if you're like me, it'll probably raise more questions than answers, but it, it was an answer. This is, this is how God answers me. I don't know how he answers you. Most of the time when I ask God a question, he answers me with six more questions. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is the answer Holy Spirit gave me to this question. Isaiah chapter 19. It says this, it says, <clears throat> A prophecy against Egypt. Now, the, the Bible, God's word, is truly beyond amazing at how it works. It's amazing to me that the Bible is a book that often speaks on uh, history. And, and when, when, the, when you read the Bible as a history book, it's an accurate book. The Bible can, can be uh, scientific. It talks about scientific things. And if you, if you read the Bible as a scientific book, then it's an accurate scientific book. But it's, it's way more than that. And so the story in, in Isaiah chapter 19 is it's sort of a, 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 a story of history, but it's also a story of prophecy. Mm -hmm. So it's a story of something that happened, but it's also... What God spoke to me is he showed me that it's something, it's a prophecy. It's a prophecy against Egypt. Now this, this prophecy against Egypt, when we read that, we automatically think, well, the country of Egypt, the nation of Egypt, the, the place called Egypt. But what Holy Spirit said to me, he said there's actually, he was talking about uh, the spirit of Egypt. Now... I don't know if the, if the name of the spirit is Egypt or not, but it was the spirit that was operating in Egypt. Now, this is more than a, a demon. This is a spirit. It's, it's a spirit that actually controls many demons, it, and it's, a, it's an evil spirit. It's a foul spirit. It's a vile spirit. But there was this spirit that was operating in Egypt. So when it says here in Isaiah 19 that it's a prophecy against Egypt that's in, in, in today we're, that's what we're going to talk about we're going to talk about this prophecy against this spirit that was operating in Egypt mm -hmm. now think about the nation of Egypt in context of, of Isaiah and the nation of Israel yes. because the nation of Israel had obviously had history with the nation of Egypt we know how how Egypt enslaved the, the Israelites. Mm -hmm. We know that, that Israel went down to Egypt on its own accord. We talked about that last week, the land of Ham. They went there, Israel, Jacob, the nation of Israel that lived inside of Jacob, 
went there, and they went there because God sent them there. But while they were there, the nation of Egypt enslaved them and wanted to control them. So the spirit of Egypt, among other things, was a controlling spirit. It was, a, it was an enslaving spirit. And it says this, a prophecy against that spirit, that enslaving, controlling spirit. Because I believe what God is going to show, what he showed me this week, is that same spirit is operating in the world today. Mm -hmm. It's operating in our country. Yes. And it's the spirit of, of enslavement and a controlling spirit that God never intended for man to live under. Yes. I believe it is God's idea for us to be free. Mm -hmm. For us to have the freedom to worship Him, to interact with Him, to have relationship with Him in whatever way He caused us to do that. For us to interact with them. While the Israelites were living in Egypt, they were not free to do that. They weren't allowed to worship. In fact, that's what Moses, when he went to Pharaoh and he talked to Pharaoh, he said, God wants you to let my people go so that, so that they can worship him the way God wanted to be worshipped. Mm -hmm. Freedom is a crucial thing to that. And Egypt, that spirit of Egypt, which is a vile spirit, was a controlling spirit. It was, it, it was demonic and vile, and it said, no, you are going to do it the way we say you're going to do it. Now, we know there were a lot of uh, materialistic reasons why the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They wanted free labor to build their cities. And they viewed the Israelites as a source of that free labor. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't have, it's interesting, they couldn't have the Israelites going out and worshiping in freedom and not being free in every way. Mm -hmm. Make no doubt about it. This spirit that is operating today in Washington, D.C., and in Columbus, and in Mahoney County, and all over the world... It's the same spirit that is trying to control you, and I guarantee you this, if we yield to it, if we do not fight against it, if we do not come against it, it will, in, it, in time, take away our freedom to worship God. Amen. History has proved that. So God said, this is a prophecy against that spirit. Mm -hmm. Now we make the mistake mm -hmm. over and over and over again of blaming man mm -hmm. yes. and fighting against man mm -hmm. and fighting against individuals and people. Mm -hmm. uh, the human race is notorious for this. Mm -hmm. It seems like if you put two people in a room, you give them about an hour and a half and they will find something to disagree on. It's amazing. You can agree on 90% of everything, but you'll find the 10% that you can come to blows over if you give us enough time. And so we blame each other. You know, I, I blame them. They blame me. I, we blame this group or that group. And we, we pick and choose and find ways to put people in groups so that we can disagree with them. And what we need to understand today is we're talking about a spirit. Because God said this prophecy against this spirit of Egypt, this spirit that operated in Egypt, this controlling, enslaving spirit, he said, see, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. Hallelujah. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians melt with fear. I want when as we read through this today, pay attention because when it talks about Egypt, it's talking about the spirit of Egypt. But when it talks about the Egyptians, it's talking about the people that live under that spirit. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. So there was the spirit of Egypt, but the spirit of Egypt 
enslaves people, it controls people, and it, it has people that are followers of that spirit. It says, I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Brother will fight against brother, neighbor against neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. Now, remember, this is a prophecy against the spirit of Egypt. And God, is, God said, I am coming to deal with you. In verse 1, I'm going to deal with this spirit. And he says, as a result of me coming, the hearts of the people that have been controlled have been manipulated and stirred up or, or controlled by the spirit. Their hearts are going to melt with fear. He said, I will stir up the people and they will begin to fight amongst themselves. They'll fight brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. The Egyptians, the people, will lose heart. And I, God speaking of himself, will bring their plans to nothing. They will consult the idols and the spirits of the dead, the mediums and the spiritists. So when this happens, when God begins to deal with this spirit, the people that have been under this spirit that have been operating under the spirit, they're going to, there's going to be dissension. There's going to be a, a civil war of sorts in that camp. Now again, when you read the Old Testament, you'll see that time and time again, this is how God dealt with his enemies. Mm -hmm. How many different stories in the Old Testament you read where the nation of Israel would be going to battle against somebody and God would send a spirit of dissent into the camp mm -hmm. and the yes. enemy would yes. go to battle against each other. And they would start to fight each other. This is exactly what's going to happen on the yes. last in the last battle. Yeah. When the, right before when Jesus comes back and, and the armies of the world are gathered together to fight against him, there's you're going to see this. You're going to see this spirit of the set come into the enemy's camp, and there's going to be confusion and disruption, and they're going to turn on each other. Hmm. It's exactly what God said is going to happen to these Egyptians or to the people that are under this spirit. That I will, uh, and, and then after they turn on each other, then they are going, the people are going to turn to what they know. They're going to turn to their God. They're going to turn to their, their, their uh, to the occult, to the, to the demonic gods that they've worshipped for all this time, only to find out that they ain't going to get no help from that quarter. Yeah. They will consult the idols and spirits of the dead, the mediums and the spiritists. And he says, and I will hand the Egyptians over to the power of a cruel master. And a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Mm -hmm. so, so I said, God, why, did, why would man succumb or why would man enter into a relationship with a controlling spirit? How did we ever get here? And God told me it's because, obviously, Satan is deceptive. You know, when Satan tempted Eve, he didn't come in the form of an ugly demon. He came in the form of something beautiful. And he came in the form of guile. And it made sense to Eve. It makes sense to us to enter into a, 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 an agreement with a spirit like this, because it comes dressed as something else. Isn't it ironic that opportunity often comes disguised as opposition? And opposition often comes disguised as opportunity. Let that sink in for a couple minutes. Think about it. How many times in your life have you faced opposition only to realize later on down the road that that opposition was actually the, 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 your greatest opportunity. Yes, yes. And how many times have you saw something that looked like great opportunity and so you embraced it and you stepped into it only to find out that it was opposition dressed as opportunity? Right, man. Yes. It's exactly what's going on today because people are embracing by, by the droves, we've been embracing this spirit of Egypt, this controlling, manipulative spirit, yes. because it looks like it's opportunity. Yes. 
It looks like it's provision. It looks like it's blessing. It looks like it's, it's something that's good for us. That's the way it's presented. It's presented like you can trust us because we'll take care of you. We'll give you all the things you want. We'll provide this utopian type of a, uh, an environment to live in. Only to find out that once you embrace that spirit, once you embrace that idea, once you get into it mm -hmm. and the door slams shut, you realize that it was a trap all along, mm -hmm. and now you're trapped into slavery. Yeah. Wow. It happens collectively, and it happens to us as individuals. Mm -hmm. Don't know if you have any bad habits that you've ever tried to to kick. You know how hard that is? If you think back on it, when you first started that bad habit, do you remember what it looked like? It looked like it tasted good. It looked like it felt good. It looked like it would bring you opportunity for a, a, a more enjoyable life. Whatever it was. Only to find out that it was slavery. That it was controlling. Talk to anybody that's, that's, that's dealing with a drug addiction. Mm -hmm. They will tell you. Food addiction. A food addiction. Mm -hmm. Any kind of addiction. It's the same thing. It starts out because it tastes good. It feels good. It looks good. Mm -hmm. It seems like it, it's an opportunity. Only to find out once you're hooked into it that you can't get out mm -hmm. without a lot of struggle and without a lot of battle. See, the, diabolic, the diabolical idea behind all that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 mm -hmm. where Satan told us, you don't need to trust God. You can be like God. You can trust yourself. You can, this is going to be better. Only to find out that it was slavery. This spirit has been around for a long time. But God said, I'm coming to deal with you. And I'm going, there's going to be, a, there's coming a time when I'm going to deal with this spirit, the spirit of Egypt. Now notice in verse 5, he says this. He says, the waters of the river will dry up and the riverbed will be parched and dry. The canals will stink. The streams of Egypt will dwindle and dry up. The reeds and the rushes will wither. We know that Egypt was built on the Nile River, one of the, the largest rivers in the world. And, and Egypt as a nation, as a, as a uh, kingdom, became powerful largely because of, of where it was built on this powerful river. Because back then, of course, rivers were one of the main sources of transportation and commerce. And so because uh, Egypt sort of was right on that river, it controlled that river. It controlled that source of commerce. And not only was it commerce, but it also was a source of water that watered the, the, the uh, immediate area. And so their crops grew great. Fishing was a big thing. So a lot of Egypt's success and prosperity came from the Nile River. And God here is saying, I'm going to dry that river up. This spirit of Egypt is going to lose its source of power. It's going to lose its source of strength. It says the, the plants along the Nile at the mouth of the river, every sown field along the Nile will become parched, will blow away and be no more. The fishermen will groan and lament. All who cast hooks into the Nile, those who throw nets on the water will pine away. Those who work with comb flax will despair. The weavers of fine linen will lose hope, and the workers in cloth will be dejected, and all the wage earners will be sick at heart. So the people that have come into agreement with this spirit are going to find themselves high and dry. That's basically what those verses are saying. Now, here's the deal. God said this would happen. 
we need to be careful that we don't come into agreement with this spirit or we're going to find ourselves high and dry. We're going to find ourselves dealing with what the Egyptians had to deal with. Because that spirit that they were trusting in, that they had sold their souls to, that they had committed to and come into agreement with, all of a sudden lost its, lost its entire uh, source of power and ability to provide for them. Same thing's going to happen to the spirit that's operating in the world today, the spirit of Egypt. There's coming a day when it is going to be left high and dry. And all the people that have come into agreement with it, whether by hook or by crook, are going to find themselves like these Egyptians found themselves with parched fields and nothing to eat and nothing to drink and no commerce and, and left them high and dry. It says in verse 11, the officials of Zoan are nothing but fools. The wise counselors of Pharaoh give senseless advice. How can you say to Pharaoh, I am one of the wise men, a disciple of the ancient kings? God says this to them. He says, where are your wise men now? Let them show you and make known what the Lord Almighty has planned against Egypt. For all of the world's uh, intelligence and everything that the world is basing its foundation on, our technology, our institutions, our governments, all of that stuff is going to come up short. And man who has based their life on that and built their life around that and come into agreement with that are going to find out one day that those men and those promises were fool's gold. There was nothing to it. God says, let these men explain what God's going to do. See, the world thinks they have God on the run. They think they're winning. They think, we've got this all figured out. We've got a plan. We've got, we've got governments, and we've got technology, and we've got all of this amazing stuff that we're working on, brand new ideas and brand new thinking and progressive ideas. And, and uh, boy, we don't need God anymore. And God is saying, well, let them explain what I'm going to do tomorrow. Because everything that you see going on around you today doesn't mean squat about what's going to happen tomorrow. Only God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And so God is taunting those men here. And he says, let them explain what I'm going to do. Let them explain how I'm coming after the spirit of Egypt. He said this, the officials of Zoan. Zoan, by the way, was, was the, the city or the place where Moses confronted Pharaoh. It was the place where the plagues happened. So there's a history here with Zoan. And Isaiah is referencing the fact that when Pharaoh was the leading ruler of the day, and in this place called Zoan is where he came up against Moses, and when Moses first came to him and said, you, I'm bringing you a message from God, he's saying, let my people go. And Pharaoh told Moses, you can tell your God to go take a hike. It was at Zoan that Moses or Pharaoh and his his advisors told Moses to hit the road. And of course it was at Zoan that they paid the ultimate price for that. Because that's where the plagues happened. That's where the, that's where Egypt suffered its great uh, defeat. It says the officials of Zoan have become fools. The leaders of Memphis are deceived. The cornerstones of her peoples have led Egypt astray. Look at this in verse 14. It says, The Lord has poured into them a spirit of dizziness. They make Egypt stagger in all that she does, as a drunkard staggers around in his vomit. 
I like verse 15. This is one of my favorites. It says, there is nothing Egypt can do. Hmm. Head or tail, palm, branch or reed. God said, this is going to happen, and there's nothing that Egypt is going to be able to do about it. What did you you're say that spirit was again? The spirit of Egypt. It's got a perverse spirit here. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing Egypt is going to be able to do to get out from underneath this. Verse 16 says, in that day. Now, pay attention when God says, in that day. Because God has declared, God has spoke what's going to, he has declared the day. Just like in the, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth on day one, he spoke it into existence. On day two, he spoke it into existence. On day three, there was a day when God created. And he said, in that day, God is declaring something that's going to happen. He says, in that day, the day has been designated. Now, I don't know when that day is. God hasn't given me that information. Could be today, could be tomorrow, could be next week. I don't know when the day is, but I'm telling you, there's a day coming when this spirit of Egypt is going to be defeated, when it is going to be destroyed. Yes. And there's going to be this spirit of dizziness that's going to come onto this spirit, and it's going to be like a chicken with its head cut off. And it's just going to be running around without any idea what it's doing. It's going to be spinning circles and making itself dizzy because this spirit is going to be totally disrupted. And we need to make sure that we are not tied into that spirit. Yes. In that day, the Egyptians will become weaklings. They will shudder with fear at the uplifted hand that the Lord Almighty raises against them. And the land of Judah will bring terror to the Egyptians. Everyone to whom Judah is mentioned will be terrified because of what the Lord Almighty is planning against, against them. You know who Judah is? Your Judah. Your Judah. I got news for you. The enemy is afraid of you. He's afraid of you. See, they're acting all big and bold. They're acting like very threatening. And they're shaking their fist at you. And they're saying to you, we've got you under our control. We've got you on the run. The truth of the matter is they're scared to death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you are Judah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And wherever Judah was mentioned, the spirit of Egypt would quake in fear. The Egyptians would run and hide whenever it was mentioned to them that Judah was coming. Mm -hmm. The enemy is afraid of you. Boy, we need to get that. Yes. Yes. We need to start operating under that idea, under that principle that, that we are not given a spirit of fear. The enemy is given that spirit. Yes. 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 See, it seems like the opposite because it seems like we're always being threatened. And in the natural, if you're not hooked into God, if you're not trusting Him, if you're not hearing from Him, you're going to react to that fear. Yes. And you're going to run and hide. Mm -hmm. The truth of the matter is, everything that they're doing today is a result of their fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're running from us. That's right. mm -hmm. They're afraid of us. They're afraid of our freedom. That's mm -hmm. why they're trying to take it away from us. That's why they're trying to destroy it. That's why they're trying to take away your very freedom to worship your God, to interact and have relationship with your God. Because the enemy knows that that thing is, that's being threatened. The enemy knows that God has declared a day when this is going to happen. And so they're terrified at the mention of Judah. Every time Satan hears Bobby's coming, he quakes in fear. Every time Satan hears Alice is coming, he quakes in fear. Yes. Yep. Why? Because we're Judah. 
You might not feel like Judah. You might not know how much power you wield. You might not understand that the enemy is running and hiding when he hears that Judah's coming. But he is. He's afraid of us. And so because of fear, they're like a trapped animal. They're lashing out and they're attacking. But it's all based on fear because they know what's coming. Verse 18 says, In that day, five cities in Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the city of sun. I like this because in the land of Egypt, in the middle of the enemy's camp, God's planting a big old stake. And he says, right in the middle of the enemy's territory, I'm going to plant my name. He says, right in the middle of the area, the territory that Satan has carved out for himself, and it's a big territory, God is going to plant his name. He said, they're going to speak the language of Canaan. And that day, verse 19 says, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt yes. and a monument to the Lord at its border. See, right now, this spirit of Egypt has you feeling like, man, I'm just, I'm just a nobody. I'm, my life is coming apart. I've got problems. I've got situations. And I don't know how we're going to get through today into tomorrow. And you're wondering what's going on. And what I'm telling you is in that day, God's planning a monument, an altar to himself, right smack dab in the middle of all your situations and all your problems. There's, going to, there's coming a day, and it's coming soon, when you're going to turn around and you're going to look back and you're going to say, what problems? What challenges? I don't remember that. I don't remember any of that. All you're going to remember is that in the middle of all this opposition, God took over. Yes. And God planted his name. There'll be an altar to the Lord God in the heart of Egypt. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord, because of their oppressors, He will send them a Savior and Defender. He will rescue them. Yes. Folks, I got news for you. There's a harvest coming. There is a harvest coming. You know who that harvest is going to consist of? It's going to consist of all these Egyptians that have been buying into and have been... Have been uh, put under this curse of this spirit of Egypt and all of a sudden when this spirit is destroyed and then when this spirit is 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 uh, it's brought to everyone's knowledge what this spirit is and how he's operating all of a sudden these Egyptians are going to turn around and say man we don't want nothing to do with that and they're going to start turning to God and we're going to see a harvest like we've never seen yes. before a revival yes. like we've never seen before we're going to see Thousands, millions of people coming to Jesus because all of a sudden this, this Egyptian spirit, this controlling spirit, this vile, ugly, evil, uh, enslaving spirit is going to be uh, revealed for what he truly is. His power is going to be destroyed. God's going to plant a stake in the middle of his territory. There's going to be an altar. There's going to be a, a place where people are going to come to see Jesus. And we're going to see, all of a sudden, you're going to see people that you never thought would proclaim the name of Jesus stand and saying, up, I believe. I believe finally in the name of God. He says, when they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, mm -hmm. he will send them a savior and defender. He will rescue them. So the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians. And in that day, they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifices and grain offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord, verse 22, will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. That's an interesting phrase right there. If you want to stop and park for a little bit, that's a good place to do it. Think about that. He will strike them and heal them. It says he's going to send a plague that is not only going to, it's going to, it's going to strike them, it's going to be a, a 
seem oppressive, but yet at the same time, it's going to be healing. Because... These people, the, the, the people that are tied into this spirit, before they can be set free, they have to see what they are. Mm -hmm. They have to see what they've been trusting in. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be an unpleasant experience. That's going to be a striking. That's going to be, that's going to be the same thing that happened to me when I was 10 years old, when I was laying in my bed and I realized, I'm not going to, I'm going to, if I die tonight, I'm going to hell. That was a striking to me. That was a blow. That was a, that was a hard thing. But in that same instant, in that striking, in that revelation that I was a sinner, it also was my healing because in that moment I trusted Jesus Christ. So the striking became the healing. The plague became the deliverance. He said, I will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord, and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. Folks, doesn't it feel good to know that you're on the winning team? Yes. Amen. Because sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it feels like you're getting beat up all the time. Sometimes it feels like the family's sick, and you're dealing with COVID, and you're dealing with uh, uh, you know, financial issues, and you're dealing with things, and you're dealing with kids that are that are gone bad, and you're dealing with issues that just seem like your life is 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 a, a wreck, and you don't have any control over, it. and it just feels like you're losing. But folks, what I'm saying to us is this, and hear this: God has pronounced us the winning team. Yes. The victory has yes. been won. Yes. This day has happened. Now, it necessarily hasn't manifested itself yet in time, but it has happened. It's a done deal. When God spoke it, it was finished. You know, when God created the heavens and the earth in those six days, he created the entire thing. You know, one of the things that, that scientists believe, I don't know how many of them believe this or... It seems to be generally acknowledged that, the, that, that science says we're living in an expanding universe. You ever heard that? Yeah. We're, we're living in an expanding universe. They, 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 somehow the universe started small and it's just expanding. I don't know how they come up with this. I don't know why they believe it. I don't know why they think it. We can't even see the next star. And they, they don't know what happened a billion years ago or whatever. And they have all these theories and things. My theory is this. We don't live in a physically expanding universe. I believe we live in a physically contracting universe. Mm -hmm. I believe when God created everything, he created everything. Mm -hmm. And it's coming mm -hmm. physically. That universe is collapsing in on itself until finally there's not going to be anything left of it. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then our spirit will be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I got off on that. She said, what are you saying? <laughs> it was part of it. What are you talking about? You parked on 22 for a second. Yeah. I'm still there. I knew I was going somewhere. Sorry, folks. Sorry. Uh, but listen, when I know what it was. God wrote it all. God created all of time in those six days. It's not an evolutionary process. It's not something he started and, and started spinning it, and now stuff is spinning off of it, and stuff is spinning off of that. It's not expanding. He created it all. He created the beginning and the end, mm -hmm. all in those six days. That's why on the seventh day, he rested. It was done. There was no more creation to take place. There was nothing else to be invented. There was nothing else to be started. Now it's true, man is expanding his knowledge of the known universe. We seem to be expanding our, our knowledge of how things work. And we expand our knowledge of physics every day. And our scientists are discovering this and we're discovering that. And, and uh, we're, we're figuring out more and more how things work. But it always worked that way. Always, from the beginning, from those first six days, God created it all. Well, he also created the end. Yes. 
in this day that Isaiah is talking about, when God is going to deal with this spirit of Egypt, that day was written down. It was decided. It was determined. The victory was won that day. It's fantastic to be on the winning team. It's been decided. God said in verse 23, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The, verse 25, the Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. If you want homework, I'll give you some homework. Take that. The rest of uh, this week, go home and read verse 25 and see what comes to you. See what Holy Spirit speaks to you because there's something there. Not very many preachers will do this to you, but I will. I will tell you when God's speaking something, but he didn't clarify it yet. There's something there. I don't know what it is yet. But there's something in verse 25. Something about the inheritance that is very powerful and very real. Those last three, That last line, blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what God has to say to you about that because there's something in my spirit that's telling me that that's really a powerful thing. But here's the deal. Remember I told you, I asked God the question, why did you gamble? Why did you risk your idea, your creation with man? And my answer came in this chapter because God said, I didn't risk anything. I wrote the book. I wrote the beginning. I wrote the middle, which is where we're at now. And I wrote the end. He said, I didn't risk anything. I know how this turns out. I know how this ends up. I've been telling a bunch of you, and I'll say it again, this ends well for you. This ends well for you. I don't know everything that you're dealing with. I know some of the stuff you're dealing with. And I know some of you are dealing with some pretty heavy stuff. Some of it I know about, some of it I see in your eyes. Some of it I feel in your spirit. I don't know all the details. I don't know all, the, all of the things that are going on. But I'm telling you, everything that's going on ends well for you. God did not gamble. He did not risk. He knew what the idea that we call America was going to be. It feels like our rights are being stripped away from us. Mm -hmm. It feels like we're coming under the control of this Egyptian spirit. Mm -hmm. It feels like the other side is winning the game. It feels like we're getting hammered in the fight. Some of us feel like we're going down for the count. What I'm telling you is, God wrote the book. He knows the end from the beginning. My warning to us is this. Do not come into agreement with this spirit. It might look like they're winning. It might look like it's opportunity. It might look like they're offering you free stuff. 
it might look like they're offering you a way to, to, to be part of the winning team, to be, to be part of the, 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 the side that seems to be ahead. Do not, do not, do not come into agreement with that spirit. Because I'm telling you what's going to happen at the end of the day. On the day that God has already determined. On that day, that spirit will be destroyed. On that day, that spirit will be exposed for what it is. And if you've come into agreement, if you've based any part of your life in agreement with that spirit, you're going to be left high and dry. Now, ironically... Ironically, the pathway to freedom is in surrender. Mm -hmm. The world tells us that in order to be free, we have to fight for our rights. We, have to f we, we get to make all the choices. The true path to true freedom is to give up your will. Submit your will to Him. The pathway to true freedom is to submit to God, to trust in Him, not to trust in yourself. By the way, until we are completely trusting in Him, we will never be free. Freedom is something that has to happen inside a man before it can happen externally. I don't care how many rights the government gives you. I don't care how many laws they pass guaranteeing you your freedom. If you're not free in your heart, and if you're not trusting in God, if you don't have freedom in Jesus, in God, you're never going to be free. Yes. You will forever be in bondage and enslaved, no matter how much they tell you you're free. And the same thing is true opposite. You can be in the darkest dungeon, in the most secure prison, and you can be locked in a cell, and you can be totally subjected to man's environment and be totally free. Because freedom... Is something that has to take place inside of you yeah. before it can ever take place out here. Yes. And as long as you have freedom in God, as long as you're trusting in Him, and as long as you're locked into Him and into agreement with what God has said, as long as you're coming into agreement with the Spirit of God, this Spirit of Egypt will never be able to enslave you. Yes. yes. That's a powerful thing. It is. Your freedom, our freedom, comes from inside of us, from our relationship with Him and trusting in Him. And people that do not know God, people that do not have that relationship, that don't trust God, they will never be free until they come to that understanding. And that's exactly what's going to happen in Isaiah 19 is there's going to come a day when that spirit of controlling slavery is going to be revealed. There's going to be a veil that is lifted. And all of a sudden, this vile spirit is going to be shown for what it truly is. Yes. And in that day, people will finally be able to say, you know what, I've been, I've been in the wrong camp all along. And they're going to turn, and they're and it's not going to. They're not going to have options. It's not going to be like, oh, you know what? Maybe I'll go over here and try this. They're going to realize, you know what? I'm I've been trusting the wrong thing. They're going to turn 180 degrees, and they're going to face God, and they're going to say, God, I was a fool. I I made a mistake. I screwed up. And Jesus, I need you. Please forgive me. And they're going to have the same salvation that we all have. Amen. Yes. Praise you, Jesus. This is God's word. This is God's word. Now I got one more question for you before I'm done. Why do you suppose God gave this word to 
Why would he gamble? Why would he risk that? I don't see a single person in this room. I can sort of see myself in there. I don't see any of this. That this doesn't look like a huge mistake. This is a powerful word. It's a powerful word. Not because it came from me, because it came from him. But he gave this word to this group. To you. Why did he risk that? To you. He gave this word to you. Is he crazy? What's wrong with him? Yeah. Why? I'll tell you why. Because he wrote the book on this group. He wrote your future. He knows what you're going to do with this. Ooh. <laughs> it just gives you a little bit of... Ooh. Yeah, move. Father God, thank you for believing in us when we don't even know if we believe in ourselves. 